Hi there, welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal here. Now, I've done a couple of videos to date on the whole subject of uh, functional dyspepsia, which is also known as FD. Now, I've been really, really struggling since I had my gallbladder surgery two years ago, as it must be said, a decent amount of post uh, gallbladder removal patients are with just a whole boatload of digestive problems and probably the toughest of these to treat or fix has been functional dyspepsia. Now functional dyspepsia is a uh, functional gastroenterological disorder. Now to the best of my understanding, the functional uh, part means that there is no obvious physical or organic abnormality that explains the symptoms. The ones I've been having are what's called postprandial functional dyspepsia. Now that uh, from the Latin means after eating a meal. So after I eat, I'll get bloating and fullness and I'll feel like I'm sort of pregnant and it's not a lot of fun and it's been going on for two years. So I have been seeing my own gastroenterologist trying to push for answers in the process of uh, trying to fix this unpleasant problem. Um, I came across a functional dyspepsia community on Facebook, a Facebook group, and uh, they're very active, great community. I will put a link in the description. Uh, more recently, I started to look for scientific papers. Do doctors actually understand what FD is? Are there treatments coming along in the pipeline? And once I began doing so, one name kept recurring in every scientific paper I read, and that was uh, Professor Nicholas Talley. He's Australian, so I'm gonna just go ahead and call him Nick. And um, he has done extensive research He's into gastroenterology, very, very uh, seasoned researcher and doctor, one of the leading uh, voices in gastroenterology research. And his, uh, one of his main areas is in the brain-gut connection and in FD. So I decided, seeing as he had done a couple of other videos on YouTube, I shot uh, Professor Tally an email to see if he might be interested in having a chat with me to attempt to get a bit of clarity for other FD patients on exactly what doctors understand about this condition and what might be coming in the drug development pipeline. So without further ado, here's our chat. Okay, so we are joined um, by Nick Talley from Australia. So Nick, firstly, thank you very, very much for uh, taking the time to, to have this conversation. I know that for um, a lot of people with functional dyspepsia, this is going to be invaluable because there's still just a sparsity of information out there on the internet, or that's my perception anyway. So you've been involved in the Rome Foundation, which I would love to mention also because I know not a lot of people, or at least there are some people who I believe don't know it exists uh, with this condition. I'd love to get your, um, your take on, I guess, where the research is now, uh, because again, uh, we kind of feel that there is unclear exactly what's happening. There's a lot of confusion regarding treatment and people's doctors trying different SSRI drugs and amitriptyline and the other drugs and uh, much 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 confusion I think is probably the best way to summarize it so um, you've done I know extensive research into the gut brain connection functional disorders um, so yeah I just love to love to hear what you have to say about all this well look thanks very much for the invitation to join you and uh, I appreciate that and uh, I hope this will be of some value to people who suffer with this condition or their families because this is really common, functional dyspepsia, at least one in 10 people around the world. So re remarkably common. Um, and what's exciting is I think the research really is advancing in this field. We're starting to understand what's going on in functional dyspepsia. I think the word functional is going to be discarded by the next Rome uh, iteration of the criteria for diagnosis because it's not functional in many many cases it's really almost certainly related to some pathology in what's called the small intestine so um uh, where to start uh well very common condition uh we know how to diagnose it so we, pe people present with feeling uncomfortable full bloated after they eat Often there's a bit of pain as well, not always, but often uh, in the sort of stomach area. Um, and it can be quite distressing. Some people can live with these symptoms. It's not too bad. Other people are really distressed, really affects them. Um, it's pretty severe. 
and uh, you know it's an important condition first to diagnose and also to manage. Um, normally, when we look down into the stomach in the upper part of the small intestine, it looks normal, which led to this concept of well, there's some problem with the muscles or the nerves or the motor function or the sensory function, but there's no real pathology going on. That was that was the story that people believed for nearly a hundred years. But we now know that when you take samples, tissue samples, when you look down with an endoscope, you can actually find evidence of pathology, particularly in the upper small intestine. And that's been the exciting shift in thinking because once that was discovered, and uh, I'm very proud of my group because we really put this on the map, once this was discovered, we recognized that this inflammation, a special kind of inflammation, probably was related to the symptoms, certainly related to the damage you see, that, that the small intestine's leaky, which is one of the abnormalities. Um, we know the nerves get damaged, probably from the inflammation that's occurring. And that means we have a target or targets to provide some treatments that really might make a difference. We also know the bacteria in this part of the gut, the small intestine, is disturbed. There is a change in the bacteria, and that's also probably important in the condition. And sometimes people develop this after a bout of gastroenteritis. You know, when you get really crook uh, after you have a, a bad meal, something you've eaten that's really uh, got infected with something, or you, you catch a, a bacteria, and you get vomiting and, 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 and diarrhea and become really unwell for a couple of days, that's acute gastroenteritis, and that can set off functional dyspepsia. So it's an exciting time in terms of this condition because not only can we diagnose it now, but we have pathology and we have new treatments. That's, that, that's very exciting um, to, to, to hear that. I mean, I think that's encouraging as well for people who kind of feel like there is either it's a uh, you know a dustbin diagnosis I think is the common way to describe it and uh, it's it's great to know that there is that do you think it, that kind of understanding of where your uh, you and your research group are with functional dyspepsia has trickled down to your average gastroenterologist or do you think there's still a lot of sort of misperceptions amongst family doctors and uh, you know perhaps more regional gastros about functional dyspepsia still being psychosomatic and and all that. Well, I mean, we just discovered this pathology in 2007, or that's when we published it. Um, but it's taken a long time for people to start to accept and for other studies to confirm some of our initial observations. It always does when you have a, a big change in thinking. But mm. it's now starting to trickle down. It hasn't trickled all the way down, don't get me wrong, but it's starting to trickle down. And these ideas are starting to uh, become more accepted and the approaches are, you know, are starting to change slowly. Um, but I can take you through the treatments that we have available right now and what works and what doesn't. Um, sure. And I can take you through some of the emerging treatments that we are likely to see very soon. So I'm happy to do that. But clearly the good news is um, you know, this condition, this common, often debilitating condition often a, a very chronic condition to it. You know, it, it, it stays with people for long periods of time. The good news is we see a real way forward and uh, ultimately with luck, cure uh, for this condition is I think on the horizon, which is very, very exciting. Amazing. Um, just before we do get into treatments, I just want to one quick question. So there's two subtypes or from what I understand of functional dyspepsia, the epigastric pain syndrome and the postprandial distress. Uh, do you think the distinction between those two types in terms of the underlying pathology, let's say, and treatment approach is very different or uh, is it really kind of different manifestations of one disease? So it's, it's a little bit complex. I, the the postprandial distress syndrome is this syndrome where if you eat something, you get crook, you get unwell, you get fullness, <laughs> bloating, discomfort, pain sometimes. That's postprandial distress syndrome. And that's where the pathology that I just described, that inflammation in the small intestine is most strongly linked. There's another group with epigastric pain, that's stomach pain just below the breastbone. 
And that group is is more complex. It's it's a much smaller group. Mm. Um, it's not always related to eating. It's probably a different condition, actually. But that is a much less common syndrome than the postprandial distress group. That's actually extremely interesting because in this Facebook group I mentioned, I think the uh, epigastric pain or the people with a lot of pain complaints are overrepresented. So I wonder if the people with the kind of bloating uh, just kind of put it down. But as you say, it can be incredibly, incredibly debilitating. Uh, I, I love that word crook as well, by the way. I presume it's an Australian word. I'm going to have, have, have to start. Uh, very Australian. To say very crook. Australian. Absolutely. <laughs> um, okay. So yes, I guess let's get into treatments in terms of uh, what we have at the moment um, in terms of the treatment options and I guess what's coming in the, in the, in the drug development and research pipeline. Yep. So look, first line therapy, and it's been first line therapy for quite some time, ever since we did some clinical trials on this, are proton pump inhibitors. These are acid suppressing medications often used for reflux disease, for heartburn, for example, uh, for peptic ulcer disease. So, you know, a common group of drugs commonly used, but what's really interesting is that they work in functional dyspepsia, no doubt about that. And what's really fascinating is they're anti-inflammatory. They reduce this small intestinal inflammation that you see on those biopsies. And we believe, based on the accumulating evidence, that in fact the reason they work is because they suppress this inflammation, not because they're acid-suppressing medications. So that would be first-line therapy. Mm. The proton pump inhibitor, safe drug relatively, can be used long term if required, can be used as needed, not long, you know, not every day, but as needed, right. uh, which is also also works for some people. Um, there can be side effects. Any drug can have side effects, right. but relatively safe compared to many medications that we use. So that's a good drug to start with. And I always start with that drug. Not everybody responds. There's no doubt about that. It, it, you know, some people do not respond. So that's what you do first. First line for medication. If that fails, your next medication that you can think about is what's called a, a, a prokinetic drug, a drug that accelerates the movement of material from the stomach and the small intestine. And there is some evidence some people with these symptoms will respond to this group of drugs. There are many different prokinetic drugs around the world. The problem is the benefits are relatively small and the drugs available around the world vary very significantly. So it depends on which country you're in to what's yeah. available. So in Australia, very limited options. In the United States, very limited options. In Asia, more options. Um, we can come back to that, but that's a group of drugs that are used and can be helpful as an additional uh, therapy. Sometimes you add that on to the proton pump inhibitor drugs. Mm -hmm. Another option is what's called an antidepressant drug. Now, this is not being used for depression. This is being used to help the gut uh, work better and have less sensation it going in the wrong direction. Because one of the problems with this condition is the gut's very sensitive and these drugs are meant to tone down that sensitivity. Yeah. The, the best evidence is, is, is with a very old class of antidepressants in low doses, non-antidepressant doses called the tricyclic antidepressants. Mm -hmm. So amitriptyline is one of those tricyclic antidepressants. And in low dose, well tolerated, safe relatively, and some people find the marvelous therapy. Some people really respond very, very well. Some people do not respond. It's it's unfortunately a little bit hit or miss, mm. but it certainly uh, certainly does work. Some of the other antidepressants, the evidence is less clear that they really have a benefit. For example, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Um, Prozac, one of those, doesn't doesn't work. It mm. doesn't work in functional dyspepsia. Whether you're depressed or not depressed, it doesn't help the, the stomach symptoms. That's very so I think that's important to recognize. There are some certain other drugs, certain other medications that can help some people, and we use those sometimes as, as additional therapies. So that's the drug side of it. But I want to emphasize to people diet probably makes 
a real difference. Mm. And that's because we believe foods set off this syndrome in some people, actually probably drive the inflammation in some people. So diet is a very important understudied component. So what kind of diets may work? A gluten-free diet works for some people. We need to understand that better. We don't know a lot about it, but it seems to help some people. Some people will use an elimination diet. Certain foods that they eliminate, there's actually uh, uh, some, some, some evidence that, uh, again, gluten, uh, nuts, uh, fish, and a few other things, uh, milk products, eliminating those can really help some people's symptoms and lead to relief. And then finally, um, a, a diet that's low in what's what are called fermentable carbohydrates, what are called FODMAPs, mm -hmm. can help some people as well. So we don't know as much about diet in this condition. We're really beginning to learn it, but there's no doubt diet can help and seeing an expert dietitian or a nutritionist can be very beneficial for some patients. And I send almost all my patients to a dietitian to help manage the patient with me. So mm -hmm. diet's important, medications can help. And then stress reduction helps some people as well. Um, probably stress aggravates the symptoms, doesn't cause them. But if you're really under a lot of stress, it can be helpful to deal with that issue as well. And we believe that the inflammation may be one of the drivers of increased anxiety in some people with this condition. That, that they have increased anxiety and that's actually driven from the gut. And that's a really important new piece of information as yeah, well. Yeah, it's ab ab absolutely fascinating this idea of this kind of two way process between gut syndromes causing, let's say, you know, psychological or psychiatric complications and vice versa, those being bad for the gut. So if somebody wants to find, and uh, I don't want to sort of make this about myself, but that's kind of what it was for me, it started with these gut problems then that can become very, very depressing as people find it harder to exercise and do all these kind of, you know, uh, common health, mental health suggestions. So if you find somebody in functional dyspepsia who, is, who had, let's say, a developed uh, depression or anxiety as a result of this condition, um, would your approach also be to use those older uh, tricyclics or, uh, you know, to go for the SSRIs and SNRIs and the more modern psychiatric drugs? So, I mean, normally I, I, it, it depends on the situation, obviously. If, if, there's, if there's depression if, and people do get depressed, I mean, lots of people get depression, it's a very common, common problem, then that needs treatment. And we will treat that with, 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 with one of the newer drugs, for example, that treats depression as part of the treatment uh, approach. Um, if there isn't depression uh, per se, then we will probably use something like the tricyclics, uh, you know, to, to help settle things down while we're also working on the dietary approach and perhaps some other treatments that I just talked about. Mm. Some people do need combination treatments because they've got a, a long-standing dysfunction of their gut and it takes quite a while for it to get back into, into, into more normal patterns. And that's just the way it is. Okay. Um, so, yeah, and that's what we do. There is some evidence that also you can um, treat the uh, microbes in the gut that are probably relevant to this condition. So you can suppress microbes, and we, we know that there's a use of what's called a non-absorbable antibiotic, a drug called rifaximin, can be helpful for some people with this condition. Um, and we do use that sometimes. Probiotics, less evidence about benefit. Probably there is some in some cases, but we're not quite sure what the best probiotic is. Mm. So that makes it a little bit complex to, to treat that. Okay. Is there any evidence, any connection between uh, this uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, and functional dyspepsia? Or has that not really been? No, there's good evidence that people with functional dyspepsia have increased small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. We don't know if that's a primary condition, in other words, whether the 
bacteria are driving the syndrome or whether it's related more to the fact that the muscles and nerves don't work properly and that means you get bacteria growing more than you would expect but we certainly recognize the association mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's more work going on to sort out which bacteria specifically may be relevant that's a lot of what we're doing now we've got very exciting work ongoing in this space with the goal, of course, of treating bacteria that really matter and specifically targeting those uh, to relieve the syndrome. And I think we're going to see some really interesting approaches there in the very near future. Um, one, one of the interesting questions I got from Facebook, and I, 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 know, I know your, uh, your time is short and we need to talk about the, the drug pipeline, but just one very quick one, if I may. Uh, is there a connection between functional dyspepsia and autoimmunity? So the answer is almost certainly yes, interestingly. So we've done some work in this. Um, we, we know that associations of functional dyspepsia include atopic diseases like asthma and allergic rhinitis. Um, and that was a little bit of a surprise. No one had really found that before, but it's absolutely no doubt about those associations and a weaker association but still important with autoimmune diseases rheumatoid diseases in particular mm -hmm. and we, we we don't fully understand that linkage but we suspect that again there is um auto antibody production probably from the inflammatory process that's what we suspect is going on uh, possibly driven by the bacteria that i'm I, i'm talking about that may change so if that's true, and that's a hypothesis we're still testing and, and, and following, um, that's really exciting as well, uh, because it might imply we might be able to treat certain autoimmune diseases as well through the gut. So again, sure. pretty, pretty stimulating uh, stories are coming out from the work being done. Okay, so in terms of Watson development, so this drug that I uh, wrote to you in an email, I kept coming across, and I think a paper you, you wrote, Acotiamide, I'm not sure if that's the correct, correct pronunciation, yep. uh, that and other drugs, what, what, what are things looking like in terms of what's uh, coming down in the pipeline? So acotiamide is a very interesting drug. It's available in Japan and India only to the mm. best of my knowledge at the present time. Uh, it's been tested in clinical trials. It is able to do something that's very important. It relaxes the stomach which actually allows that feeling of fullness and uncomfortableness and, and, and pain to sort of settle right down. Um, and we think the reason the stomach doesn't relax properly is the small intestine affects the stomach and that's why the stomach doesn't relax. So the drug works by not working on the small intestine, works on the stomach. Uh, and it's fairly effective. Um, the clinical trials suggest some people will even get complete symptom resolution. It will go away, the symptoms. Not everybody, it's a small number, but those who do, do very, very well. So it's a good drug. I don't have any clinical experience with it myself as it's not available to me in Australia right. or in the United States. Um, but it's certainly a drug that I think may end up coming more, becoming more widely available. And mm -hmm. it seems to be reasonably well tolerated which is again a good a good piece of information to have so that's a new drug relatively new that is actually available in some places there are other drugs that target the inflammation in the small intestine turn off the inflammation and so there are some really interesting new drugs that can literally just switch it off and they look very very promising not only for the inflammation but also for the symptoms that people develop with this syndrome. A lot of work going on in this area. Um, a number of companies are working uh, to develop drugs that will uh, follow this line. Um, and I think that looks very exciting, particularly for people with really severe functional dyspepsia, where mm. you know that's the group you target these drugs to, in my view. Okay, and I mean, I guess that the million dollar question for sufferers is, Obviously, there's the clinical trial process, there's the process of FDA approval, EMA approval. These things sound wonderful, but how long is it going to be before our local gastroenterologist can take out his prescription pad and write us up our acotiometer or a small, a small intestine modulators? So look, I think it does take a little while for these things to work through the system. So it takes some years to get through a clinical trial program. There is a clinical, there are a couple of clinical trial programs 
underway right now, a couple are really quite close to finishing. Um, so that is exciting because that could lead to earlier approval, you know, because they're already well advanced. Uh, but it depends on the results of those studies, of course, to see where they end up. So I think we're a little way away from that. In the meantime, repurposing drugs already available is work that we're doing and other groups are doing mm. to see whether we can make a difference with drugs already that are available. And again, don't forget, diet is a very important <laughs> piece of this. And uh, that's uh, cheap, safe and available. So again, very important for people to recognize. There is a lot of overlap in the group between uh, people, you know, suffering from GERD and IBS and these other conditions. Uh, do you think the, there is any link between these two, and um, is is there a connection? So it's almost certainly there is a connection. People with functional dyspepsia are more likely to have irritable bowel syndrome, particularly the diarrhea subtype of irritable bowel syndrome. More likely to have gastroesophageal reflux disease with bad heartburn and sour taste, acid taste coming up and damage to the esophagus. We know they're linked, but what's really interesting is this small intestinal inflammation looks like it's one of the drivers for some of these patients with these other conditions. And what's exciting about this is that means we may have some new treatment options for these diseases too. And that's an enormous number of people around the world who, who, who might benefit from uh, new approaches. So we're very excited about this idea that because we know what's going on, at least in some patients with functional dyspepsia, we might be able to make a real difference, perhaps even a curative difference to patients with other conditions that are also remarkably common and burdensome. Wow, thank you, uh, Nick Nicholas. So thank you very, very much for your time. I think just on behalf if I can speak for other people with FD, I know that this interview, or I hope this interview, is going to be uh, tremendously appreciative um, just to know that there is um, an understanding, a growing understanding in terms of uh, what's causing this, treatment options um, is very encouraging. So thank you very much for taking the time today to share uh, your clinical experience and your research experience uh, with me today. So Daniel, thanks very much for having me. It's been a great pleasure. I hope uh, my comments uh, have given people some hope, if, if nothing else, uh, about uh, this condition and related conditions. It's really exciting. And, uh, you know, I, what, what, what excites me in particular is the idea that we get, we're making advances that may change practice and make a real difference to people uh, and patients. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick. So that was my chat uh, this morning with uh, Professor Larius Nicholas Talley, through and through Australian, and uh, one of the leading uh, research gastroenterologists in the entire world. So it was an amazing privilege uh, to be able to ask him some questions about functional dyspepsia. And I just have to say that listening back, I just spent the last hour editing that interview. Uh, not Nothing was taken out, just editing pauses. And I think there is a great deal of, of uh, scope for hope in uh, Professor Tally's comments, just in terms of various ways, uh, if you're also really struggling with FD and maybe not getting answers uh, from your doctor, that dietary interventions, a few different drugs to be tried. And uh, for, those, for those of us not in Japan or India, uh, hopefully not so much longer uh, left to wait before those, uh, those newer drugs uh, that are more directly going to treat FD uh, are going to come to market. So that's uh, definitely room for hope there as well. Uh, thank you very much to the Functionalist Pepsi Facebook group for sending in questions. I unfortunately didn't have time uh, to ask uh, Professor Tally every one of those, uh, but I hope that for FD patients, this was useful. I just want to say one very, very personal thing close to my heart uh, because we did talk about uh, psychiatric comorbidity and all that kind of stuff. And I just would say that the last two years dealing with this has been so so mentally challenging and i would just encourage anybody uh to get help in that respect if they need it because there's often a feel that if you do that you're kind of admitting it's all in your head or even if your doctor seems to take that attitude uh, that's not a good reason not to get help if you need it because uh, i it's it's all going to help and it's all uh, related and uh, professor tally's research into that gut brain connection has uh, just kind of elucidated that so thank you guys for watching um, and hopefully more videos coming out about fd on this channel at some point in the future